beginning our session, I'm so happy that we have someone who is at home uh, in the throne room as well as in the conference room. <laughs> we have with us today, um, oh gosh, I've forgotten my notes. <laughs> One second. We have Rajiv Chaladurai. Pardon the nerves. All of us want to make a difference. And this is a man who's truly put that in action. He's taken 28 years of experience, hand-on experience in the corporate world into his everyday life by helping other believers find their purpose in their life. Uh, Rajiv Chaladurai believes his purpose is, a, is SIT. It's an acronym for speaking, inspiring, and teaching. And he's a renowned author. He works to build leaders. And he has uh, a recent venture known as the Purpose Project, which helps individuals discover and live out the unique purpose in life. As a practicing Christian, most of Rajiv's teaching is inspired by the Bible, and he ascribes his journey to his gleanings from the teachings of Christ in the Bible. I, it's my pleasure to welcome you, sir. I told Tina to keep the introduction short, but I think her nerves got to her. Anyway, so excited to be here. Uh, I really think it's an honor, it's a privilege for me to, to be able to stand up before you guys this morning and to share a little bit what God's taught me, teaching me, uh, specifically in the area of purpose. Thank you for taking time. You could have done many things this Saturday morning. Uh, you could have chosen to chill at home and beat the traffic. Uh, the weather is nice, 21 degrees, that's really cool. The air is crisp compared to Mumbai and the pollution from where I come from. Uh, but you guys chose to be here. So I really believe that God's going to deposit something into your heart across the day. Uh, maybe it's a line, maybe it's a word, but I really believe that um, you know, God's going to deposit something and I really believe it's going to be life-changing because it's not the, man, the word of man that you've come to hear, but you've come to hear from God, yes? And, and when you have that level of expectation, I want to tell you God never disappoints, right? You will receive from God what you need to hear from God. Just have that level of expectation. I'm going to, speak, I'm going to be speaking to you on the topic being purpose, uh, purposely purposeful, right? But before we get there, if it's okay with you, can we just look to God and prepare our hearts to receive from Him, right? Father, we come to you this morning. We're not here to listen to the voice of any man, but we're here to listen to the gentle whisper of the Holy Spirit who's got something specific and unique for each of us this day. And we believe, Lord, that as we listen, you will speak. Speak, Lord, for your servant is hearing. Let no other name but the name of Jesus alone be glorified. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to speak to you about uh, purposely purposeful, and I, have, I want to start with the question, and the question is, what on earth am I here for? What on earth am I here for? So this is a question that is, um, uh, you know, that, that comes packaged in different ways, right? And for me, I think purpose is best defined in one word, and that one word is meaning. And if you look at today and where we live at, I think today the greatest loss is not so much an economic loss, which is true, but the greatest loss is the loss of meaning. And that's exactly why you see it manifest in different ways. You see it manifest in terms of very high suicide rates. You see it manifest in terms of relationships not working. You see it manifest also in terms of mental health and certain issues like that, right? Meaning, purpose. And I want to tell you, purpose, in my mind, purpose is the why of you. Purpose is your divine design. And there are so many explanations to the word purpose, and very good ones at it. But for me, in my, I think the best definition of purpose is found in the word of God. And it's found in, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, right? And, and this is what it says there. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, contained in these words is the definition of purpose. 
And if, if I can break it up for you, okay, because I think as you break it up, you will gain perspective of the power this verse contains. So let's break it up. The first is God's workmanship. Who are you? You're not just a no nobody. Who are you? You're not just an anybody. But you know, who are you? You are God's workmanship. And if you read other, other uh, translations or versions of the Bible, there's another word which is used for workmanship and it's the word called masterpiece. Is it there? For you are God's masterpiece. And I want to tell you that's a very deliberate choice of vocabulary right out there. You are God's workmanship. You talk about workmanship. You know, a workmanship, the, the meaning that comes out there is like a master craftsman working on an exquisite piece of art. And my friend, you are that piece of art. And I am that piece of art. And who is this master craftsman? It's God, the maker of heaven and earth. And he says, you are God's workmanship. And I want to tell you that when you look in the mirror, don't look at, don't look at the image that, that comes out of the mirror as, you know, basis the labels that people have put on you. Basis the scars that life has given you in terms of experiences. The labels that people have said, hey, you know what, you're not going to amount to too much. Right? You can only do so much. You're only good in this area. You're not good in these areas. Just do what you can. No, no, that, those are labels that people have put on you. I'm so reminded of Gideon. And he had that encounter with the angel and, and Gideon's already hiding himself in that, in that, um, you know, the, in that wine press and, uh, you know, and, and threshing flour. Wrong place to be doing that. But he's so scared. He's so fearful. And the, agent, and the angel comes to him and addresses him. Hey, Mighty man of valor. And Gideon's like, who, me? Me? Mighty man of valor? I think you got the wrong address here, right? He says, no, you are the, Gideon, mighty man of valor. You are going to be setting your, you know, the people free. How can I do it? Because the labels tell me I'm the least of my, of my, fam my family. My family is the least of the tribe. My tribe is the least of all other tribes. But the thing is, my friend, this is what you got to pick up, right? Man chooses bases your past, but God, you know, considers your potential based on your future. And that's why he says you are God's workmanship. The second aspect of that verse is, you know, you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for, for what? Everybody, can I hear you loudly? For good works, for good works. The singular reason that God has created you in Christ Jesus as a masterpiece or as a workmanship is not so much for you and me to walk with a chip on our shoulder and say, you know what, I'm God's mas masterpiece, I'm God's workmanship. No, no, that's not the real reason. The real reason why God has taken so much of care and precision to craft you in your mother's womb is, that, is for you to engage with those good works. This good work, which each of us sitting, I'm guessing there are 100 odd people in the room, each of us, right, that good work is unique, it's specific, it's distinct, and I'm convinced that God has created and designed us and fashioned us with precision that with his help, we will not just be able to engage, but we'll also be able to accomplish the good works for his glory. Good works, good works, God's workmanship, good works. And the third phrase in that verse is prepared beforehand. For you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, it's not that the good work that God has prepared for each of you and me, right, isn't an afterthought. He didn't create you and say, okay, shall Kya karenge with this person? What we will do? Right? He didn't, he's, not, he's, not, he, he's not like thinking about, it's not an afterthought. It's not a knee-jerk reaction. But the word of God says, these good works which God had thought about and prepared, he's prepared it beforehand. Which means that even before your parents had an idea about you, 
God has already prepared those good works that you and me should be walking in. And the key word there, so that you should walk in them. You see, every time you see this phrase, walk in them, in, the, in scripture, it means, what it actually is conveying is, you've got to be living in them. It's not about, I do these good works when I have time. Let me check my calendar and see which white space I have for good works. Or which white space, or you relegate your good works as a hobby. No, it really means you should be spending a significant portion of your time engaging in the good works which God has prepared specifically for you beforehand. I mean, you put all of this together, right? You get the definition of purpose. And let me tell you, that's the most authentic definition of purpose. Everything else is pale, could be even artificial, superficial. But this, for me, is the definition of good works, of purpose. For you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. That, my friend, is purpose. That, my friend, is purpose. Let's unpack this a little further. I want to take you to a close but not ex close imitation of purpose or, or a close cousin of purpose, right? And that is called success. That's called success. So what should I do? Should I pursue purpose or should I pursue success? And I want to ask this, let me ask you a question. I'm digressing a little bit. How many noteworthy people do we have in the room? Don't feel shy. Don't feel extra humble. You can raise your hand. How many noteworthy people do we have in the room? Okay, let me change. You got one. Ramesh is one. So let's give a round of applause for Ramesh. But, but no, no, I'm just kidding. Wait. <laughs> but how many want to become noteworthy? Go on. Be honest. Don't feel shy. This is not raising hands. This is raising hands. Right? I'm going to give you a secret. Not just purpose. One more secret I'm giving you. How can you become noteworthy? Take notes. Okay, so if you have that wow moment, oh, this is for me, right? There's a pad and a pen given to you not to practice your signature or doodles, right? But to capture those moments, right, which God has given you. So, so you, here's one line. You can be successful, but not purposeful. You can be successful, but not purposeful. But every time you are purposeful, by default, you are successful. You see, a good life isn't measured by the number of days lived. A good life is measured by whether we accomplished, with God's help, the purpose that God has prepared beforehand for you and for me. It's not measured by number of days. We've got that wrong. Then, if it's measured by number of days, then probably Jesus didn't have a good life. Right? It's not the number of days. It's about whether we accomplish God's purpose which he's ordained for us in our lives. A verse I like which talks about this is found in Acts chapter 13 and verse 36. And it's talking about David. Right? For David, after he had served, keywords, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. And was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. You know, it's my prayer that, you know, I can just replace the word David there and put my name there. And so should it be for all of us. That after Rajiv, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. Right? A good life is measured not by the number of days, but whether we accomplish our purpose or not with the help of God. And I just want to bring about this, this whole this whole relationship between success and purpose. Success is, is temporary. But purpose is the raw material for legacy. But even after you live, right? And, and, when, and when God calls us home, that purpose continues. You know, I spent a lot of time in um, CMC Hospital in the year 2016. My daughter was really ill. And she was there in the hospital for about 90 days. But in those 90 days, you know, it gave me an opportunity to, to understand more about the institution called Christian Medical College Vellore. How many of you have been there? Yeah? And I got, I got to read the autobiography of uh, Dr. Ida Scudder. Right? And I said, wow, what a life. 
What a life. You know, she said, we're not, we're not, we're not building a, a medical school, but we're building an institution where, God, where people can experience the healing hand of Jesus Christ. And that, and, that, and that purpose is still continuing so many years after Ida Skarda passed away and went. That is an example of purpose. That is an example of purpose. You see, success is self-focused. How do I look and what can I get and how much power do I have and how much influence do I have? How many followers do I have? That's the latest one. Right? How, how, you know, it's all about self-focus, but purpose is about making a difference. Purpose is about impacting others. Right? Purpose, simply put, is, is, is about becoming the person God intended you to be rather than achieving the standards set by the world. That's why the Apostle Paul reminds us, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. You know, see, you don't need to put an effort to be conformed by the world. The world is just molding you in. It takes an effort to be standing out and being counterculture and living according to the standards of the world and, and engaging in the purpose that God has created for you and for me. I'm going to share with you three verses. I'm going to, we're going to unpack it further from there, right? One verse which is very familiar with all of us and such a beautiful verse, right, is Psalm 139, a couple of verses, 16 and 17. Where the psalmist writes there, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book. Right? Before even one of them came to be. All the days ordained for me were written in your book. Even before one came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts. God, how vast is the sum of them. When I unpack this, right, this is what I get. That you and me are crafted with divine purpose. We are engineered with specific talents and we are built with precision under divine supervision. That's who you are. Not just some random being just walking, walking down uh, Koromangla. No, you're not. Right? Or got, getting caught in silk board. Right? You're not that person. Right? You are crafted with divine purpose, engineered with specific talent, built with precision under divine supervision. Some of you are sitting there and are thinking, hey, all this sounds very motivational. You don't know my life. No, I can hear you, by the way. Right? I've got these strengths, so I can hear that mental gossip. But I want to tell you this. Right? It, it probably means you have not yet acted on the talent that God has deposited in you. And one thing I can show, I'm really sure, and I can, I can, I, I, I can, I'm really sure that every one of you has a God-given talent. It's just that maybe you've not recognized it. Or maybe you've recognized it, or you've not had the courage to act on it. And maybe that's why God's got you in the room today. The next verse I want to draw your attention to is, is Philippians 2.13. Philippians 2.13 says this, right? For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fill, fulfill his good purpose. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. You see, the burdens we experience in life, I got to be doing something about the kids on the street. You know, I got to be doing something about I see a lot of LLJ people here, lead like Jesus. I got to be doing something about teaching people about how they can lead like Jesus. I got to be doing something about counseling. I got to be doing something with standing with single women. I got to be, where is that coming from? Right? For it is God who works in you. To will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So the burdens we experience your inclinations in terms of which domain you want to go in terms, in terms of a career choice. Your unique wiring in terms of talents and gifts. I mean, I love the worship this morning, right? I mean, if I want, even if I stand on my head, I can't sing like how he sang, right? Because he's uniquely wired with that gift. I'm not wired with that kind of a gift. The specific talents and all of this concur to Paul's writing in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. So we saw three verses. We saw Philippians 2, 13. We, we started with 
Ephesians 2.10 and we saw Psalm 139. And if you just try and juice out the essence of all the three and synthesize it together, this is what I get. These verses clearly indicate the following, that God has ordained the days for us. It isn't just the number of days, but each day has been thought through by God. Even before I stepped into one of them, you've written it in your book. Right? Although sometimes it may feel that the days are just random, you know, things happening, it's just the same monotonous thing. But I can assure you that there is no randomness according to God. In fact, there is a divine plan which we refer to our unique purpose. And therefore, I want to ask you this question. Why is it that we pursue certain paths? Why is it that, you know, I, I'm inclined to do what I want to do, which is work with people and, and somebody else wants to work with writing code and somebody else wants to do something about baking and somebody else wants to get into a ministry of intercession. Why is it that we are pursuing certain paths? Why? And the answer is because we are divinely motivated. And the answer for that, again, we saw in Philippians 2.13, right? For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work, right? For his good purpose. But there's one caveat here, my friend. And the caveat here is that we are called into a relationship with God and not just into a legal, religious kind of an arrangement with God. Because the word of God says the steps of a righteous person are ordered by God. It starts there. The starting point is, I need to be in that relationship. And as I, as I see that, as I walk in that relationship, I find the Spirit of God directing me in where I need to be. A few years ago, actually it was 2014, there was this Chris Tomlin concert that happened in Hyderabad. Any of you went there for that? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I remember seeing you there. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, yeah. So Chris Tomlin concert, I went there to Hyderabad. My aunt was there at that point in time and uh, stayed with her and my kids were small. And, you know, as a family, we, we just love dogs. Yeah. In fact, I think we love dogs more than kids. Uh, my kids are not there. Don't record that, please. Right. But we love dogs. My kids love dogs. We all love dogs. Right. So my aunt realized that and she took, her, took us uh, in our car to a friend's place, which was a a drive outside the city and it was a farm his friend stayed and this and it was not just a farm it was a dog farm right and you had breeds of dogs different types of breeds of dogs and you know this was a couple uh, the husband was an engineer by profession I mean he studied engineering uh, the ladies into academics and all of that stuff but the passion of the man was you know dogs and he had this great motivation towards dogs and so they went outside of Hyderabad uh, you know a small village there and they set up this huge dog farm there and they would train dogs and dogs from all over the country would be sent there for their training dogs from you know the reserve banks of india uh, i'm told even you know senior politicians you know they would send their dogs and hotels would send their dogs airports would send their dogs these people would just train those dogs and send them it was just amazing. We had this amazing few hours with the dogs, playing with the dogs, and so on and so forth. I got into a conversation with that, with that gentleman, and I said, uh, so uh, you've studied something about dogs? Uh, he said, not really. You know, I have this passion for dogs. I always had this passion for dogs. So I said, uh, so what do you do for, uh, for Kana? Uh, I mean, I asked it very decently, not like this. But <laughs> so he said, uh, I, I didn't get you. So he said, no, uh, besides dogs, what do you do for dog, three-letter word, another three-letter word, job, job. So he's like, this is what I do. I said, what do you mean this is what you do? He says, yeah, this is what I do. I said, what about engineering four years, father paid fees and all, what happened to that? He said, no, all that's fine. This is what I feel I should be doing. And I've dedicated the last 20 odd years just for this. I was like, wow. And he said, you know, all our needs are taken care of. You can see it. Everything is taken care of. I said, then, oh, wow, okay, that's good. But he says, Rajiv, you know, you got to know something else. This village that we stay is, is was a Naxalite infested village. Okay? And therefore, you'll have all these people there, the tribals there, and all of them there. What we've done in our farm, we've actually started to employ these people who otherwise would have got into this Naxalite activity. We started hiring them, training them, giving them jobs. And we started to rehabilitate. I said, wow, that's really good. 
And he says, hey, you see that tank there, that huge tank there? I said, oh, I see it. Is that where you give the dogs a bath? He said, no, no, no. That's where we conduct our services near the tank and we baptize people there. And we are raising disciples in that Naxalite infested village. You see how the dots connect? How the dots connect? For it is God who works in you both to will and to work, right? So that you may fulfill his good purpose. He just gave himself to his, the, the motivation that God had placed in his heart, the gift that God has placed now to train dogs. And, you know, and his wife, they were running a school there where those kids get free education and all of that, right? The whole village, you know, in a matter of time really got rehabilitated. And today is one of the, I mean, the literacy rate in that village is very high. Everybody's got jobs there, right? That's the power of a divine purpose. And, and, and the work we do is just, a, is just a vehicle which God uses. The things that we do is a vehicle that God uses so that he's able to accomplish his good purpose. Moving on. Talking about success, right? Success is often, um, what, is the, what is your definition of success, by the way? It's so important to get our definition of success right. Right? Because the worldly definition of success is net worth, Network, power, influence, exterior focus is very extrinsic. That's the, that's the standard of, it's what car do you drive, it's how many bedrooms do you have in your house, and right, uh, it's what's the brand of your clothes, it's, it's just that, right? Somebody said this so beautifully, we are spending money that we don't have to please people who really don't care about us. <laughs> right, why? Because we want to be successful, we want to look successful, right? And we have a choice to make. And the choice is either we pursue the standards of success as defined by the, by the world on, or we become the person that God intended you and me to become. That's the choice. There's nothing you got today. Get the choice. And what's your response to that choice, really? A few years ago, there was this man who died well into his 90s. He was perhaps one of the most influential person, right? Presidents came for his funeral. But the ironic thing was he didn't figure in the Forbes list of, of millionaires or the Times list of most powerful people, but yet he influenced the lives of millions across the globe. His name is Billy Graham. His name is Billy Graham. What did Billy Graham do? He said, I'm going to pursue my God-given purpose. I'm going to engage in the good works that God has prepared beforehand for me to actually do. So I want to move on and I want to ask you this question. Therefore, how do I identify my purpose? How do I identify my purpose, right? And there are, in my mind, four elements to it. The first is what I call personality, right? The second is what I call as potential. The third is what I call as passion. And the fourth is problems and problem. And if you, if you answer all these four questions and unpack these covers, you'll actually find at the intersection of personality, potential, problem, uh, per uh, passion, and problem, therein you find purpose. Right? What is personality? Personality is how is God wired you? Right? Your inner man. Your values, your beliefs, your temperament, introvert, extrovert. Always the most difficult question for introverts to answer is, how many introverts do we have in the room? Can you raise your hand? <laughs> right? Very difficult. I'm an introvert, by the way. Extroverts, they'll raise both the hands and the legs. <laughs> right? But I want to tell you guys, and this is for the introverts, right? Uh, the there's, the extroverts aren't greater than the introverts. Can we hear the introverts say an amen to that? Oh, wow, quite a few introverts, right? The extroverts are not greater. The introverts are not greater. It's just that the introverts, you know, they get their energy by being with themselves. The extroverts get their energy by being around people. That's the only difference. And God has deliberately made us, wired us, some of us to be introverts and some to be extroverts and so on and so forth. Right? That's your person or personality. Your potential is your innate strength, talents, and ability. You know, for some, just picking up a guitar and playing it comes so easily. Yeah, for people like me, if I go for class, and believe me, I've gone for class. It's just not work. The, the tutor quit, by the way. 
it doesn't come. I mean, just to play one chord. I, I remember I practiced, practiced, practiced. It took me five and a half years. And I started playing the chorus for Showers of Blessing. And in Chennai, it stopped to rain after that. <laughs> right? It doesn't come. But for others, just a few strums, it comes. How? Because they have an innate ability. For some, you know, baking the cake comes so easily. I don't know why I'm talking about cakes. Maybe I'm hungry. Right? But for others, you know, it's a colossal disaster with collateral damage. Why? Because you got that innate ability, you got that talent which God has given you. Right? Passion. Passion is that area where you invest your energy and effort. You spend a whole day and a night, but, but you know what? You're still feeling fresh and, fresh and rejuvenated and full of energy. You got your adrenaline flowing, even though you spend so much of time across the whole day because you've been operating in your area of passion. But for, if it's not your area of passion, even five minutes, you're like, boss, I need a break right now. You're tired. You're exhausted. Why? Because you're not operating in your area of passion. And when potential and passion come together, magic happens. Right? And finally, problem. It's not the kind of question that we, I mean, remember when you, have, when you get into a fight, you go and ask somebody, hey, what's your problem? But I seriously want to ask you, what's your problem? Not that way. But actually, what's your problem? What's that burden in your heart? Which, which, which creates a kind of a restlessness within you, saying, i got to be doing something about it. Not the kind of, you know, the burden that we have about Bangalore traffic. Bangalore traffic are always like this, yeah. We commentate. No, I'm not, I'm not talking about a burden which you commentate on. I'm not talking about a burden which you criticize. Oh, whatever government comes, always problem. I'm not talking about a burden which causes you, but I'm, causing, I'm talking to you about a burden which causes you to get up and say, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and do something about it. That burden. What is your burden? Don't ignore those burdens. Because very often, it's these four which drive you towards the direction of your purpose. Right? And, and you know, I want to take you again to the Apostle Paul. And he's writing to his protege, Timothy, his spiritual son. And he's instructing him, he's mentoring him, he's advising him in those first and second letters of, of Timothy. And amongst that treasure trove, Paul mentions something specific in both letters. I'll quickly zoom in there. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14 and 15, this is what he says. He says, do not neglect the gift you have. Everybody say, do not neglect the gift you have. <laughs> Look to your neighbor and say, do not neglect the gift you have. <laughs> Some people are pointing and saying, you don't neglect. No, no. <laughs> you point yourself and say, do not neglect your gift, right? Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Look at the next line. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. What words are? Amazing. God has given you gifts. And you know what most of us have been guilty about? We've neglected them. Or we've, or we've underestimated them. Or we've said, no, I'm going to look foolish if I get using them. Do not neglect the gift you have. And he says something, practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that it will be evident to all. I want to tell you this, right? Talent, you heard this before. Talent is what God gives to you. Right? What you do with your talent is God's gift. Your gift to God. Talent is God's gift to you. What you do with your talent is your gift to God. And I want to tell you, I want to take this further. I want to tell you that, you know, talent is in a very raw form. But it's your responsibility and my responsibility as we practice them and immerse ourselves in them so that our progress may be seen by all. You know, it's your responsibility and my responsibility to take that talent and convert it into a gift. To take that talent and convert it into a gift. And you're saying, hey, Rajiv, sounds good. The English is great. But how do I do it practically? Well, I want to give you a formula. Never been great in math. My math was so good in 11th standard that they introduced a new group in my school called uh, Accounts, Commerce, and History. Because my school had a 100% pass rate, and I was really giving it a, a solid risk of breaking that record for the last 100 years. But here's a formula, by the way, right? Converting your talent into a gift is, how do you do it, right? Skill improvement plus effort into time. 
So you got a talent, right? For example, the talent of playing the guitar, right? It, how can you improve? How can you upgrade that skill? If your talent is writing chords, right? How, don't be satisfied where you are. How can you upgrade that skill, right? And when you add effort to it, you're spending time, uh, effort, and practicing and doing this and you know, working out different ways to, to, uh, on that, and you multiply time into it, that's what makes you, right? Convert a talent into a gift. There was this guy in, in Switzerland. He loved hitting the tennis ball. He loved it. He loved the feel of the ball hitting the sweet spot of the racket. He loved the forehand and the backhand. But you know what he did? He kept, he kept upgrading his skill. He spent hours on the tennis court doing that. And he kept practicing and practicing. And that's what converted a young Swiss, Swiss boy who loved hitting the tennis ball into a Roger Federer. Right? So upgrade your skill. Add, add effort to it and multiply that by time. In 2 Timothy, the second part I want you to focus is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 to 7. The Apostle Paul says this, For this reason, I remind you, I remind you, God's brought you here for a reminder, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. What language here? Fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you. I want to tell you everybody, in you there is a gift of God. Fan into flame, which is in you through the laying of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. You see where that verse is coming, how it's connected, what's the context? Do not, you know, I, I want to remind you, there's a gift in you. Fan into flame that, fan into flame that gift. Okay? I really believe this advice for Timothy is also advice which is relevant for you and for me. We need to realize, we need to recognize, we need to acknowledge the specific God, gift of God which is lying in you. And I want to tell you, you and me are so unique. God didn't make another you. You've heard that before and it's so true. But yet we want to be like somebody else. Stop trying to be like somebody else. Learn to become who God has created you to be. Right? And, and the gift that God has given you is so unique, right? It can, it can be anything from, from acting to athletic skills, from business skills, right, to Bible teaching, from culinary to choreography, from dancing to developing talent, from evangelizing to encouraging or even entrepreneurship. What is your gift? Are you neglecting it? Are you keeping it for the weekends? No. Your gift or talent isn't meant to be relegated as a hobby. If you can write that sentence, please write that. Your gift that God has given you is not meant to be relegated for as a hobby. It's meant that you're going to be spending a lot of time into it. You're going to immerse yourself in it. That's why the gift is given to you. Right? Fan into flame. For me, that's the language I see is a, is the, you know, a vision that I, the image I see is sitting around a bonfire. We've all been through around bonfires, right? It's all exciting when the bonfire starts, but suddenly the fire starts to go down. <clears throat> and somebody comes and fans the embers, fans it, and somebody is blowing into it. And suddenly the embers just, just jump up, leap up into a flame again. And God's brought you here this morning for this conference. So those embers would leap up into a flame. That you will fan into flame the gift which God has given to you. You know, I remember it was 2016, I was sitting outside the ICU of, uh, of, of CMC. My daughter was battling for life inside. And I was sitting there and I could, and I was seeing people there so sad and, you know, people crying when, you know, a dead body was going, relatives crying. And then the Spirit of God spoke to me. Not so dramatic, but spoke to me. And said, Rajiv, do you understand the brevity of life? So stop wasting your time and start living out your purpose. At that point in time, I was a CXO for a Tata Group company. I was really living the dream according to the standards of the world. But I, I was like, God, I think you got me in the wrong time. Maybe you should come back a little later. I, don't you see, I'm, my daughter's not well and all of this. But God can be stubborn and thank you, thank God that he can be stubborn. Kept chasing me. Long story short, I ended up quitting my job and to start living out my purpose. I said, God, but you know what? Business and all, no, I can't even buy tomatoes, Lord. I can't even negotiate buying tomatoes. How will I do business? He said, for I will teach you how to profit 
and I will direct you in the way you should go. Just trust me. But I said, Lord, how? He said three things to me. I'll put you in the minds of people you don't know. They will call you. I will give you ideas from heaven. That will be your strategy. And you will always have enough. This was 2017. This is 2023. I want you, like we sang the song, God is faithful. He's done exceedingly abundantly more than I can ask or think of. Right? And the beauty of it is, right? The beauty of it is, over the last, whatever, six years, or I want, I'm saying all this to give God glory, right? Because I know how useless I am. More than 1,000 people in the marketplace have been coached and we've had that one-on-one -on -one interaction with each of them. Had the opportunity to stand before people who I would act very bold in front of them, but inside I know that I'm, I'm shaking and shivering, right? With CEOs of large organizations, I'm shaking and shivering inside, but I'm like the duck on the surface looking so calm, but inside my legs are just going all over the place. But only then I remember the verse, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, be bold and courageous, do not be frightened or dismayed, for I am with you wherever you go. And God has made me stand before such places. And today, the greatest joy is being able to make a difference to people in the marketplace and also inside the church. That's my personal witness to the glory of God. So I want to ask you, what is that state of your gift? I want to encourage you to fan it into your flame. Fan it into flame. Your God-given gift and your burdens, your potential, your talent will lead you to your God-given purpose. Right? But you're probably saying, but Rajiv, do you mean I had to quit a job? Do I have to quit my job? No, no, please don't quit your job. Don't, don't, after this conference say, I came to this conference, the speaker said, quit my job, I quit my job, I'm jobless now. I'm not responsible for all of that, right? If God specifically speaks, do whatever he asks you to do. But you're saying, hey, but on a job, how can I live out my purpose, right? If you go to the next slide, which is called the purpose circles, right? Um, okay. Can you see it? I'm, I was trying to be a little artistic there, but you know my talent is potential is not art. You can make that out. But you see the first one, which is, uh, which is career, right? You may have this job, but there may be a small portion of that, which is your purpose, right? What do I really mean by that? If your purpose is, you know, I want to train people. I want to encourage people, right? But my job is, uh, you know, other stuff. Maybe it's a sales job that I'm doing. How do I encourage people? I had to get sales. I'm rated by how did I meet my sales target or not? Sure, you do that. But can you take a small portion of that? And can you start training your team members in your team? I used to do that when I started my career. I never knew that God would make that, that small portion of that circle, which is called purpose into a larger portion, which I spend a lo lot of time coaching and mentoring and training people. That's the large thing that happened. What you should actually do is move from, you know, uh, perhaps as you move up in your career, move along your career, you know, the purpose segment of that circle becomes larger and the other things that you do on your job become a smaller portion. And that's the, perhaps the transition that you can actually take. So if you're in a job and saying, how can I live out my purpose? Find areas where your potential, your, pa your passion is, your burden is, and start carving out some time to just engage with that, either at work or even outside of work, right? The calling circle, the calling circle, where some of us may have the privilege to operate from, is your purpose is, is, a, is a big part of that, of that circle, but the smaller part is doing everything else, doing everything else. If you have your pad there, I didn't put it up there, but I'd just like to introduce you to a, to a matrix, right? And the matrix goes like this. Um, on top, you've got um, not interested and interested, right? Not interested, interested. And on this side, you got not necessary and necessary. You got it? Everybody got it? Not interested, uh, interested, uh, not necessary, necessary. And there'll be times in life where you have to do work which is necessary, but you're not interested to do it. That's the point I'm trying to drive. That's, that's part of it. That's part of your, the deal, right? So there, are, there is work that I do which I'm really not interested to do, but it's necessary for me to do. But there is this other part, right, which is interested and necessary, like what I'm doing right now. For me, this is interesting and necessary. And I try to find a large portion of my time doing that. Right? You get what I'm trying to say. I'd like you to take this matrix and whenever you have time, go back home, right, and put all the work that you do 
and try and block, put it into these blocks and say, how much of time are you spending on, on necessary but not interested, necessary, interested, and the others, right, which is unnecessary but interesting. Scrolling, reeling, all that, unnecessary, there, it goes there. I'm telling myself, not you, right? And the other one, which is uh, unnecessary uh, but not interested as well, right? I mean, those meetings that you don't need to be part of, those boards you don't need to sit on, right? Just get yourself out of that place. Get yourself out of the place, right? So that's what I'll actually talk to you about, right? Moving on, and I'm trying to wrap this up. What are the consequences of living or not living out your purpose? I want to tell you that when you live out your purpose, it is personal satisfaction that money can't buy. Personal satisfaction that money can't buy. Tina said Rajiv's purpose is to sit, speak, inspire, and teach. That's the place where my potential and my passion collide. I want to tell you the kind of satisfaction that I get out by doing that, money can't buy. But the amazing part of our God is, right, he uses that that intersection in the marketplace, which becomes my tent building to do everything else that I can do for my ministry, for God. And I want to tell you, when you do that, right, you become a public blessing. God has blessed you. Why does God bless you? So that you can become a public blessing. That's the reason why he blesses you, right? Secondly, the consequence of purpose living is significance. Don't live for success, which is very transitionary. Live for significance. And when you live out your purpose, it births significance. And significance is created by sacrifice and not by indulgence. Okay? When you find out your purpose, you find meaning. You find the why of your life. Simon Sinek says, begin with the why. And I can't agree with him more. Right? You know, when you know your why, you will know what and how to do. But when you don't know the why, you'll end up doing any how any what, and you'll say, thank God it's Friday. But when you live, when you know your why, you'll say, thank God it's Monday. In fact, you won't just say, thank God it's Monday. You'll say, uh, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. <laughs> because this is the day the Lord has made. You know, all of that will become a reality when you start to live out your why. Okay? When you're living out your purpose, you end up living for a cause that is larger than you. You're not living for your purpose. You're living for buying that, that TV screen which is larger than your neighbors. Right? You understand the brevity of life and you make the best of every opportunity. And you engage with your good works and you live out a legacy that supersedes your lifetime. Right? And the most important thing is you don't end up with regret. You don't end up with regret. And talking about regret, right? I want to talk to you about the richest place that's ever there on planet Earth. Which do you think is the richest place on planet Earth right now? Sorry? Okay, I'll talk to you separately. Anybody else? Which is the richest place? Hey, you guys have seen my notes, yeah. <laughs> that's all it is. I am not giving this as supernatural revelation to both of you, right? Actually, it's the graveyard. Actually, it's the graveyard. I don't know who, to, who to attribute this quote. I read it in a book by a guy called Todd Henry. Uh, but I've seen several others who said they said it. But listen to this quote. The graveyard is the richest place on earth. Okay? Because it is here that you find all the hopes and dreams that were never fulfilled. The books that were never written. I'll write the book one day, ek din. Hum honge kamyab. Aaj nahi, ek din. I'll write the book, boss, surely, one day. In the graveyard, you'll find the books that are not, never written. The songs that were never sung. The inventions that were never shared. The cures that were never discovered. All because someone was too afraid to take that first step. Keep with the problem or determined to carry out the dream. You see, in this graveyard quote, Actually, reminds me of that parable in 20, uh, Matthew 25, 14, 13. Remember the parable of the talents? Three guys, five, two, and one. Five guy multiplied, the two guy multiplied, the one guy. What did he do? Yeah, and the master was very angry. Uh, and you know, and he came to the master and he wanted to sound very brilliant. He came to the master, the master said, Tell me what you did. He said, 
I know who you are. He's telling the master, right? You are a very tough man. You reap where you do not sow, right? I mean, if I was a master by now, I would have slapped him, right? I'm asking him a simple question to give me an explanation. That's the problem, right? When you don't, when you're not accountable uh, with, with what was given to you, you'll always have an explanation. Anybody gives you an explanation, watch out. He gave an excuse. And he was not justified. Excuses will not justify us. But anyway, the master was angry with him. But is the master's angry anger justified? Because he gave him one, he gave back one. And the answer is yes, the master was just, anger was justified. Because he was angry with him, not because he didn't lose it, but because he didn't use it. I want to say that again to all of us here, including me. The master will be angry, not because we didn't lose it, but because we didn't use it. The gift that was given to you. The purpose that was assigned to you. And therefore, one day when you look back at your life, you'll either look back and say, wow, thank you, God, for the days and for the opportunity, or you'll look back with regret. The choice is regret or satisfaction. The choice is temporary thrills or permanent significance. The choice is being indifferent or choosing to make a difference to many by living out your purpose. So what are the obstacles to purpose? What are the obstacles to purpose? And this is what, these, this is, these four things keep us away from living out our purpose. One is, one is the fear of failure, right? What if I try this and I fail? You know, and trust me, when I, when I chose to pursue what God had asked me to, I had that fear of failure. I had to, I had that fear of failure. Right? It was crazy, right? And I said, God, and I, and I was trying to be very heroic before I quit my job. And, and, the, and the moment I wanted to quit my job, before telling my boss, the CEO of the organization, before I could tell him that, my CEO called me and said, hey, Rajiv, would you want to take up this opportunity of being the CTO of the organization? It was like a double promotion for me. And I was like, oh, I was supposed to tell him I want to quit. What do I do now? So I said, I'll, give me a day and I'll come back. And I told my wife, wow, Judith, you know what? CTO position, double promotion. You know, this is more money, more this, more that. Thank God for a while. She looked very patiently at me. She made me listen to all my excitement. And it's like puncturing a balloon she punctured. She said, you're going against the will of God. So I held her hand and I said, let's pray about this. You know, sometimes the best defense is what? Pray about it. So let's pray about it. And I volunteered. I didn't want her to pray because if I, she prays, the whole tone will go. So I prayed. I said, Lord, if it is your will, Lord, for us, and I'm being very melodramatic with my language, if it is your will, Lord, Lord, if for us to get out of the boat and walk on water, please tell us, Lord, because we don't want to take an emotional decision. I said, Amen to that. And I'm driving to work and I'm standing at a signal which is called um, Elphinstone Road signal for those of you who are familiar with Mumbai. On a good day, um, on a good day, it will behave like Silk Gate. Silk Road uh, signal. On a bad day, it's uh, Silk Road into two, right? It was one of those days, right? I'm standing there on my car and I'm just seeing my Instagram feed, right? And there's a picture there which says, when God has told you to get out of the boat, you have no business staying in the boat. My eyeballs almost popped out. I, I lifted my specs and wiped my eye. Saw it again, it's still the same. Took a screenshot, sent it to my wife. And said, oh, this is God, right? Signal changed from uh, red to green, and I'm driving seven minute drive to the office. Driving in the seven minute, my mind changed. Social media, people will post, yeah. How can all this, you know, you can't. Simply people will post some coincidence, you're believing all this, what is wrong with you? So anyway, next day I'm going to Singapore on work, right? I went to Singapore on work. Evening, there's this kingdom invasion meetings happening in Singapore. My friends call me, I'm no mood to go for, a sing for this, because my mind is in a whole dilemma. But they kept pestering me. I said, okay, I'll go. I got into a taxi and I'm having this argument with God. I said, God, I don't want to go for this meeting and all. But what to do? I'm going. Now, because I'm going, who am I talking to? Maker of heaven and earth. Right? Because I'm going, you have, to, you have to speak to me, Lord. But the amazing part of God, right? He can deal with our immaturity. So I go there and there's Heidi Baker preaching. I've never heard her preach before. And she preaches for about 90 minutes. And 90 minutes, 80% of the time, 75 to 80% of the time, I recorded it. One line she's saying. You know what's that one line? God is telling someone here, get out of the boat and walk on water. I was blown to bits. My friends who knew the situation, they were crying. I was consoling them. Right? And I, I recorded that and I sent it to Judith, my wife, and she said, boss, very clear, let's just quit. Right? So, so I was afraid, Lord, what if I fail, Lord? What if I fail? 
But I want to tell you that when you trust God and walk with him, right, failure, he, it's his responsibility. Our responsibility, trust and obey. That's all. Don't worry about, don't worry about what, but focus on the who. So fear of failure is a big obstacle to live out your purpose. Second is fear of finance. What will I do? I have no money and all of that. And I want to, I want to give you balanced advice here, right? And the balanced advice here is that pray and ask God, time your move in terms of living out your purpose. There was somebody who came to me for advice and said he wanted to become a Michelin star. Actually, you heard me right, baker, right? So he wanted to get trained and he wanted to do all of that stuff. He said, can I quit my job and do it? I asked him a few questions and finally I said, don't do that, right? Instead, what you do is during the weekends, carve out time, go and learn, get trained, right? Second, start experimenting with your products, right? Third, start marketing your products because it's not a conflict with what you're actually doing, right? Do that, right? And then in time, uh, when the time is right, you will know it, God will make it clear to you. So I want to give you the same advice. So is there a way for you to experiment on the side? Whereas, is there a way for you to upgrade your skill? Do that. Is, do you have enough money in the bank to sustain you? Because when you, have the, when you have the pressure of finance, you will just not be able to do what you have to do, right? So if you have at least six months of money in the bank, um, can you build that up? Can you have that? Maybe that's the right time for you to go. But more than, more than the logical thinking, wait on God for his time. Because in his time, he makes all things beautiful. Right? Wait on God for time. Then there's a fear of others' opinions. What will others think? When I quit my job, people said, are you mad? Man, you've reached CXO level. Right? You got your flying business class and you're, you, you know, you, uh, you're the youngest there in, in your group of the executive committee and all of that stuff. Right? You've got a great future. You can go, you can become CEO in three years' time. You can, you can join Hong Kong, the corporate office, or you can join the Tata office. You go to the Tatas and full-time work with the Tata group. Like, you've got so many options. And then some well-intentioned people came to me and said, hey, Rajiv, don't be stupid. Your daughter also is not well. Your wife is also not working. Single income, what will you do? All logical things they were telling me. And I was like, will I look stupid? And then you have, there comes a point in time when you have to realize it's better to look stupid in front of people, right? When you want to please God, rather than displeasing God and looking wise before people. And I've realized one thing, guys, right? What will others think? You want breaking news? Others are not thinking about you. They're thinking about what others are thinking about them. And I've realized others, no other has come and paid my electricity bill. I only have to pay my electricity bill. So don't be worried about what others think. Be worried about what God thinks, right? And your spouse thinks, important. And the last one is the fear of uh, standing out, which means operating with a pioneer's mindset and not going with a sheep mentality, but being able to stand out. You know, there are days, honestly, there are days, to be honest with you, sometimes when I look at my colleagues, my peers, they've made CEO right now, large firms, and I'm like, I'm, I'm nothing to complain. God has treated me so well. But I'm like, what if I was there, right? I also could have made CEO, no? I will be thinking that. That's when God knocks me on my head and said, hey, your walk, your journey is a different journey. You focus on this journey. Don't focus. The biggest enemy for living purpose is comparison. Stop comparing. Look up to God. Where he leads, I will follow the shepherd of my soul. That should not just be lyrics of a song, but that should become the reality of our life. Sometimes, unfortunately, we end up trusting the lady on the GPS more than we trust the voice of God. Should be the other way around. We should trust the still small voice of God. It says, hey, I've got you. Just go where, I'm, where I am leading you. So, I want to close, right? And I promise you, this time I'm going to close. Um, Missing out on life or purpose will result not just in a missed chance, but a missed lifetime. Missed lifetime. When you don't live out your purpose, you end up not valuing the valuables. And the valuables are God above goods, family over fortune, memories, creating memories over monetary gains, and health over wealth. People are just sacrificing sleep and they're all in the hustle mindset. And I've got nothing against hustling. But God tells us, 
you know, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength, will, will mount up with wings like eagles. But we want to hustle. Stop hustling. Learn to wait. In God's kingdom, if you want to experience the power of God, it comes by waiting. You're going to hate me for saying this, and not by hustling. But that's the truth. Right? And therefore, we want to sacrifice our health. We sacrifice our health to get wealth. And when we get the wealth, there is no health. Therefore, we end up the, using the wealth to try and get health. Why all this? No, beginning is to take care of your health. And follow the word of God. If I follow the good shepherd, goodness and mercy will follow me. But right now we want to follow after goodness and mercy. But God says you got the order wrong. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Follow God, yeah. Your shepherd, yeah. Goodness and mercy will follow you. Let's get the order right, right? The quality of the legacy that we leave behind is entirely dependent on our pursuit of God-given purpose. You're either striving or you're living out your purpose. You're either running on a treadmill to reach the destination of success, but it feels like an illusion. Running a little fast and say, if I get there, I'll be happy, but I'm not yet happy. That's what the illusion of success does to you. And you end up feeling disappointed and frustrated. On the other hand, if you say, Lord, here I am. I'm unworthy. I'm unskilled. But Lord, that's the kind of people you call and choose. You qualify the unqualified, but I'm here. All that I can give you is my availability and I give you my obedience. Do something out of me. For I am your masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, that I, may, that I should walk in them all the days of my life. Help me to walk in that. Help me to walk in that. And finally, my friend, I want to tell you this. Remember, you can be successful but not purposeful. But every time you're purposeful, you will always be successful. Let's pray. Father, many things said here this morning. And Lord, I pray that we would not have just come here to listen to some speech. But we, we pray for the power of one word. That one word from you will change our lives. And that whatever has happened thus far in our life, Lord, we want to choose to forget the former things. Because when we forget the former things, that's when we can see the new things that you're doing in our life. And I pray for a new beginning. Even as the year ends, I pray there will be a new beginning that happens in our life. I pray for all those gifts that are there which we have kept buried right down inside. That this day, there will be a fanning into flame that happens. That many flames would leap up in this room. Many flames will leap up in this room. I pray where faith is low, I pray that faith will arise. I pray that today, Lord, there will be many labels that are removed, oh Master. Labels that life and people have placed on us, Lord, will remove and we will see our identity as God's masterpiece. And Lord, that we will, that we will dare to take a risk because risk in God's kingdom is spelt as faith. That we will walk in faith and not by sight. That Lord, our our lives are not so much determined by the economies of the world, but are determined by the economies of the kingdom of heaven. And Lord, I speak a blessing over everybody here. And I pray, Lord, that courage would arise. And I pray that many stories would arise from here. And Lord, there will be great testimonies that will arise for your glory and for your kingdom. I pray that, that this room will be a room full of purpose-filled people. People who will purposely pursue purpose, that the, that the name of Jesus will be glorified. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, and all of us said, Amen to that. Amen. God bless you.